Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Get your King James Bible. Turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 4. We're going to do a little commentary on it. Jeremiah is a kind of a depressing book, my opinion, but uh, it pronounces judgment upon a wicked people and a wicked land and restoration for the remnant. All right, verse one. If thou will return, if thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, Return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove. What's an abomination? That's a sin that God really, really, really hates. And the Lord says, you put away your evil, you won't be removed. He's talking about them going into captivity, slavery. And thou shalt swear, the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness, and the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Now, when a farmer plows a field, they're breaking up the hard soil, making it loose, making it easy so that the plants, their roots can go down deep into the earth, get nourishment, and grow up to be a strong, healthy plant. And the Lord says, don't sow the seed among thorns. You know, it can make a whole Bible study on just not sowing among thorns. Now, is this a command for farmers? Or does this have a spiritual application? Well, I think it has a spiritual application. Thorns. Now, one of the things in the King James Bible, and only in the King James Bible, is the what some call the law of first mention. For example, you take up the to, uh, look at the word thorns and you say uh wait a minute lord's talking about fallow ground and thorns uh well, wait a minute he's talking about the spiritual nature of people and now he's talking about farming what's up with that well go to the first place in the king james where the word thorns appears Read the context, and uh, maybe there's a uh, an idea of what he's talking about. You know, what the Lord's talking about. Thorns. Huh. I mean, let's face it. If you're a farmer and you're planting stuff, uh, you want to cook thorns, and, you know, thorns would be a little hard to chew. What do you think? Um yeah. So, turn to Genesis chapter 3. My opinion, one of the, absolutely the most important chapters in all the Bible. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he, the serpent, said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall need not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, 
We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, who is this old serpent? Well, the serpent. Who is the serpent in the garden? Well, if you go to Revelation 12 and verse 9, the Bible says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. Why is it called the old serpent? Because it had been around for a long, long time. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. The devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Huh. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. Is there a second witness? Yes. Revelation 20 and verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. The Bible says that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall everything be established. And I've heard people say that the devil and Satan are two different beings, two different entities. Well, you're an idiot. Because the Bible says, which is the devil and Satan. So, was this in Genesis 3, is this a, a, a snake talking, a serpent? No, no, it's a figure of speech. Jesus is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, did Jesus have four legs and a mane and a tail? No, absolutely not. He was also called the Lamb of God. Did he have wool, four legs, and go, bah? No, it's a figure of speech, people. You know, just like when guys look at a really attractive woman and says, wow, look at her, what a fox. You know, obviously she's not a four-legged creature. It's a figure of speech. But the fruit of the tree which is, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the woman said unto, and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Ah, remember now. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. So here's the first time in scripture the serpent is talking and he, he, he lies. He says, you shall not surely die. No, God's not telling you the truth, girl. Don't listen to him. Well, that's the Bob translation. Verse 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Yeah, God is the man, and he's keeping you down. I'm going to give you secret knowledge. You know, but God's trying to hold you back, hold you down. Girl, girl, you follow me, and I'll take care of you. For God doth know of that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Take the word evil, E-V-I-L, put a D in front of it, and what do you got? Devil. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, 
and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. In 1 John 2 and verse 16, we read the pathology of sin. Uh, it, it's a, pathology is a medical term. Ology means study of, like biology. Bio means life. Biology, study of life. Mythology, study of myths. Theology, study of God. Pathology has to deal with uh, disease, the path, the path of disease. You know, somebody gets sick in California and then they fly to New York City and then the disease spreads to New York City. You know, they were studying, that's what they mean by pathology. You know, maybe you get a virus on your hands from touching a doorknob and then you rub your eyes and then the virus goes from your hands to your eyes and then from there it goes into your nasal cavity and next thing you know your lungs are infected pathology so let's look at the pathology of sin first john 2 16 for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. Uh, Chaplain Bob, what are you talking about here? Well, Genesis 3, 6. And when the woman and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Huh. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, right? The tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to, to be desired to make one wise. The pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Hey, where are, you, where are you guys? Where are you guys? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee, that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, It's the woman's fault. Oh, wait, no. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Yeah, God, it's, you know, that woman that you gave me, it's her, it's her fault. Yeah. Verse 13. And the Lord God said unto woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Yeah, it's, it's that serpent's fault. He's the one that did it. That word beguiled, that is a very interesting word. It has layers of meanings. You should look it up sometime. Modern dictionaries uh, just don't do it justice. Verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed, cursed, above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity 
What is enmity? Extreme hatred. And I will put enmity between thee, the serpent, and the woman, and betwixt thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Huh, what does that do for feminism? Huh? Woman's liberation? Sounds like that's from the serpent, doesn't it? Yeah. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Listen carefully. Thorns, thorns, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Thorns, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, and dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Interesting. Thorns. Thorns. First place they're mentioned is when there's sin in the garden. In Numbers 33, 55, the Lord gives a stern warning to Israel to drive out the Canaanites, the satanic Canaanites from the land. What does it say? But if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns, thorns in your sides, and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Joshua 23.13 Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you, and scourges in your sides, and thorns in your eyes. What's a thorn in your eye going to do? It's going to make you blind. Physically? How about spiritually? and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until ye perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. You can read Judges 2 and 3. Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. What's a snare? It's a trap. It's a trap. All right, we're getting close to the end about thorns, but let's listen to Jesus here. Matthew 13, verse 1. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat and the whole multitude stood on the store, uh, shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And no, we're not talking about uh, sewing cloth on clothing, right? We're talking about a, a farmer that sows seeds into the ground, right? And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside. And the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell among, uh, some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. 
And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some seed, and some fell among thorns. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked, choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some and, hum, some and hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, so the disciples came and said to Jesus, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Uh, hey, Jesus, why are you speaking in all these parables? Well, what's up with that? Verse 11, He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. What? Chaplain Bob, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, time out here. My pastor, all the churches, uh, they always told me that Jesus spoke in parables to give an earthly story that had a heavenly meaning so that plain, simple people could understand the stories. You know, because they, they weren't, they didn't go to, uh, uh, you know, Bible college they didn't go to the synagogue seminary you know they were just simple farmers so my pastor told me that you know uh, they 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 made these stories up so that the people would understand sim simple stories you know after all farmers are not educated in theology uh but that's not what jesus is saying here jesus said I speak unto parables, because it is given unto you, the disciples, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. The Lord's actually using the parables to hide this from those, believe it or not, there were people the Lord hid the meaning of this too. Now, don't get me wrong. When you seek the Lord with your whole heart, you'll find him. He'll find you. But a lot of these people were following Jesus because of the bread and the fishes. And they wanted a magic show. Hey, Jesus, let's see that magic show. Heal that sick guy. I want to see, you know, another magic trick. Uh, you want proof that uh, a lot of people were following him just for the food? John chapter 6, verse 25. And when they, the crowd, had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. You know, you're following me around for a free meal. Verse 27. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. You know, important, right? All right, so back to Mark, Matthew 13. Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. 
and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed. Their spiritual eyes, right? Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receiveth seed by the wayside. You know, the, the farmer that's sowing the seed, right? But he that received the seed into stony places is he the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy received it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation, you know, trouble, or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Boy, I'll tell you what, that's, uh, that's the TBN crowd right there. You know, as long as God's willing to bless you with money and goods and health and everything of your heart's desire, you'll follow God. But God forbid you lose your job and your house because of your faith in Christ. Oh, well, hey, I didn't sign up for this mess. Heck with that. I quit. They're offended. Verse 22. Here is the thorns right here. He also that received seed among the thorns, he also that received seed among the thorns, is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Ah, that's what thorns are. They choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Now, if you plant a tree, a fruit tree, and it doesn't produce any fruit, what good is it? I mean, really, what good is it? Verse 23, But he that receiveth seed into the, into the good ground is he that heareth the word, and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Thorns, people. Thorns. When Jesus was being, uh, after the trial, when they were getting ready to crucify him, and they were mocking him, the Roman soldiers, in Matthew 27, verse 29, what did they do? And when they platted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They put a crown of thorns upon Jesus' head. Yeah. In Hebrews 6 and verse 8, But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Uh, if you don't have any fruit and you bear thorns and briars, you're going to be rejected, you're cursed, and your end is to be burned. Burned! That's why fruit is so important. 
A tree, a fruit tree that doesn't bear any fruit is worthless, right? Cut it down, burn it. Why should it take up space in your yard? Get rid of it. Maybe God feels the same way about his garden. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, not the flesh. Circumcise yourself spiritually and take away the foreskins of your heart. Ye men of Judah and Jer inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire. What do they do with uh, thorns? Oh yeah, fire. And burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Declare ye in Judah and publish in Jerusalem and say, Blow ye the trumpet in the land. Cry. Gather together and say, Assemble yourselves and let us go into the defensive cities. Huh. Now, military, and even the U.S. military used to do this back in the, uh, the uh, you know, like back in the Old West. The bugle call. You had one for charge. You had another for retreating. And there's seven trumpets in Revelation. And at the seventh trump, the Lord is going to gather his people. The last trump. Somebody tell the pre-trib rapture people that. They don't believe it. Not for a second. But that's... Uh, <laughs> at the seventh trump, the Lord's army is going to come. And he's going to assemble his people. All right, verse 6. Set up the standard towards Zion. Retire, stay not. For I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. The lion has come up from his thicket. And the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate. And thy cities shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. For there is gird you with sackcloth. A sackcloth. People would take off their comfortable clothing and put on sackcloth, which was extremely uncomfortable to wear. And then they would take ashes and put it on their head. For this gird you with sackcloth, lament and howl, for the fierce anger of the Lord is not turned back from us. And it shall come to pass at that day, saith the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish, and the heart of the princes and the prince and the priests shall be astonished, and the prophets shall wonder. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, surely thou hast greatly deceived this people and Jerusalem. What? Chaplain Bob, I'm confused. God deceive these people? Uh yeah. Yeah, when when you uh when you don't listen to the Lord, he will deceive you. You know, there are churches in San Francisco. Yeah, and they absolutely believe that the Lord created them the way they are and that men can marry, well, each other and that God will bless them because they're committed in their relationship with one another. They actually believe this. I used to not believe that. I used to think, well, no, Satan's deceiving them. No. God deceives them. 
Then said I, Ah, Lord God, surely thou hast greatly deceived this people in Jerusalem, saying, Ye shall have peace, whereas the sword reacheth unto the soul. See, these people were all the pre uh, priests and prophets and everybody saying, Ah, oh, we're going to have peace. Whereas the sword reacheth unto the soul. At that time shall it be said to this people and to Jerusalem, A dry wind of the high place in the wilderness toward the daughter of my people shall... Uh, I'm sorry. Toward the daughter of my people, not to fan, nor to cleanse, even a full wind from those places shall come unto me. Now also will I give sentence against them. Does God deceive people? Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, if you don't think Satan has power and signs and lying wonders, read Job chapter 1, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God, not Satan, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Oh, okay. You see, they... They wanted their pleasure more than they wanted the Lord. Churches in San Francisco, anybody? They absolutely believe they're saved. And they'll even get a Bible like the NIV that, uh, you know, deletes uh, certain words that uh, shows what they're doing is evil. Yeah. Yeah. They'll even get themselves their own Bible that explains away the thing that they're doing that God hates. Oh, yeah. And God's like, oh, okay. I'll let you think you're saved. No problem. Jeremiah 4.12, Even a full wind from those places shall come unto me. Now also will I give sentence against them. God's pronouncing a sentence against them. You know, when, you, when you're brought before a court for a crime, and you go before the judge and he pronounces a sentence, I sentence you to 10 years in jail or prison. Verse 13, Behold, he shall come up as clouds, and his chariots shall be as a whirlwind, like a tornado, people. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness. What? But, but, but. Chaplain Bob, Jerusalem's supposed to be the holy city. Well, argue with Jeremiah. Don't argue with me. I'm just, you know, reading the, the prophet. O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness. Uh, you think anything's changed in the last few thousand years in Jerusalem? No. No. O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? Vain means worthless. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? For a voice declareth from Dan, and publisheth affliction from Mount Ephraim. Make ye mention to the nations, behold, 
publish against Jerusalem that watchers come from a far country and give out their voice against the cities of Judah. As keepers of a field, are they against her round about because she hath been rebellious against me, saith the Lord. Thy ways and thy doings have procured these things unto thee. This is thy wickedness, because it is bitter, because it reacheth unto thine heart. My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace, because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Destruction upon destruction. Destruction upon destruction is cried. For the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children. They have none understanding, but uh, they are wise to do evil. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. Uh, just a quick note here, people. There are people that believe that there was a earth before the earth, or a creation before the creation, and they use this as a proof text. And like the Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall everything be established. I don't know if I believe that. I don't, I can't find a second witness anywhere, you know, that there was a earth before the earth. And then they say that there was a creation before the creation. And then there was Satan fell and had a war and it was destroyed. And then the Lord had to start all over again. At least that's what some people teach. I don't know. I just, I understand where they're coming from, but I just don't see enough uh, evidence to go that route. But then again, I look at this verse and it doesn't, it, I don't know. Just something to point out. You'll, if you study the Bible long enough, you'll, you'll run across that. So I beheld the mountains and lo, they trembled and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld and lo, there was no man and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and will not repent. Neither will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee for the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into thickets and climb up upon the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken and not a man dwell therein. And when thou art spoiled, what will thou do? Yeah, when everything's destroyed, what are you going to do? Though thou closest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, though thou rentest thy faith face with painting, in vain shalt thou make thyself fair. Thy lovers will despise thee. They will seek thy life. Uh, the lovers. What are they talking about here? Well, Remember, Judah was to be the bride of Christ, or the bride of the Lord. 
But they didn't want him as a husband, so they went after other lovers. The Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians. But, it says, thy lovers will despise thee. They will seek thy life. They're going to try to kill you. Verse 31. For I have heard a voice, as of a woman in travail, and the anguish of her that bringeth forth her first child. The voice of the daughter of Zion that bewaileth herself, that spreadeth her hand, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is wearied because of murders. And that, everybody, concludes commentary, Jeremiah chapter 4. Chaplain Bob Walker here. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.